uh, to watch and use as, as you want. Um, so without further ado, I'll move to introduce our first speakers, Ms. Audrey Rojkov from the A uh, AFD. Uh, Rodri, uh, Audrey is the Secretary General of the Finance and Commons Summit. She also served as the Deputy Executive Director in charge of strategy partnerships and communications at the AFD. She is an expert in climate finance and used to be an energy project manager and operation coordinator with the Green Climate Fund and the African Development Bank. And she was nearly 20 years, uh, she has nearly 20 years of experience in Africa working on issues related to de development. So I'll hand it over to you, Audrey. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, good morning, good afternoon to you all. Uh, first, I would like to very, very thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to present the summit and to have this discussion with you today. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here with you and I will um, present you the submit. Uh, uh, you have the presentation on the screen. So we can show, for example, the first slide. Um, I would just like to present you um, what we want to achieve uh with the finance and common summit we have two main three i would say main objectives uh, for this summit first we would like to gather for the first time all the public development banks of the world we are 450 and we have never been uh, gathered all together uh, ever. So we want to be together and to discuss our role, ambition, challenges, and opportunities and have this uh, discussion together. The second objective is to bring around this community of public development banks, the broader financial community and discuss with all partners the capacity of the public development banks to reorient and leverage all financial flows in the direction of climate and sustainable development goals. The third objective is um, uh, to contribute to reinventing the multilateralism uh, as we all see uh, uh, there is a need to, to to push uh, new forms of multilateralism and this new group of public development banks may contribute to, to join forces at the, the global level. Uh, we, uh, I, I can present you uh, uh, the banks, uh, what we are exactly talking about. So as I said, we are uh, 450 public development banks in the world evenly distributed uh, in every region of the world. We have uh, 100 uh, banks in Europe, uh, 100 in Latin America, about 100 in Africa, and about 100 in Asia. Um, this is in terms of number of banks, but in terms of assets, of course, it's not uh, uh, exactly distributed the same way. Um, we are operating at uh, local, national, regional, uh, international or multilateral level. And we are generalists of specialized institutions. You all know uh, we have uh, public development banks specialized, for example, in supporting SMEs, agriculture, uh, housing, trade, and so on. So there is a very huge uh, diversity in this group with very different models. But we have the strong conviction uh, that with our public mandate and roots uh, in the respective economic and social fabrics, we can build bridges between government and the private sector, between domestic and international agendas, between global liquidity and microeconomic solutions and with, of course, the short-term and the long-term priorities. 
In terms of short term, you all know that we provide urgent and counter-cyclical responses during times of crisis. And once again, today, all public development banks are fighting the impacts of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. We have played a counter cyclical we are also, we are now playing a counter cyclical role to relaunch uh, the global economy and providing a wide range of measures, contributing to support the health system, as well as to address the exacerbing inequalities generated by the crisis. In terms of long term, we are also pursuing objectives of reducing inequalities, protecting the planet and promoting sustainable development. This means uh, preparing for a post COVID-19 world that will require a long awaited paradigm shift to make the recovery a resilient and sustainable one. So we know and we discussed it before, decision-making processes and financing are too often driven by short-term considerations and need to be aligned with long-term sustainability objectives. So this is why we think and we are very convinced that we can contribute to reorient the global financing towards climate and SDGs. And as such, we have certainly a unique role to play in the financial system. If we can go to the other slides, uh, I can tell you more about uh, the program. So the event will last um, four days, but we will have on the 9th and the 10th a research conference presenting the role of the public development banks. Um, on the 11th of November, we will have a kind of gathering days uh, for the PDBs. Uh, we will have uh, workshops and meetings, a uh, general assembly of uh, the regional networks of uh, PDBs and other events. And on the 12th of November, this is a big day of the summit. Uh, where uh, we, we will organize one plenary session with heads of state, two high-level panels with, uh, dealing with cross-cutting issues, and 10 high-level events on more specific uh, thematics. Uh, beside this, we will have a project platform to, to launch uh, projects and initiatives. Uh, we can go to the partners. So since January, we are preparing the summit and we have the support of uh, many partners uh, that are part of our executive committee. We have uh, the patronage of uh, our president uh, because the event will be in France. We have uh, the support of uh, the UN Secretary General and we have, of course, all uh, the banks represented by their um, uh, chair or secretary generals of uh, the regional networks. We have the IDFC, we have the World Federation of CFI, uh, which includes uh, ILIDE, ATFIA, ATFI, ETC, um, LT, sorry, uh, and ATFIMI. And we also have the European networks, uh, EDFI and EAPB. We are also working with the group of multilateral development banks. In terms of international institutions, we are working closely with the OECD and the, the European Commission and the United Nations. And uh, for your information, we have the, the label of uh, COP15 and COP26. Um, in terms of deliverables, if we can go to the next slides, um, I would like to share with you uh, our um, main objective, uh, the main outcome uh, we are uh, developing. Uh, we are doing to, we are going to, to mark the occasion of the summit uh, with uh, the signing of joint declaration. 
his declaration as well as uh, the overall program of the summit is built around uh, four questions and all the four days of the summit uh, will be developed to address these four questions. The first one is to clarify the raison d'être. Um, is there a common thesis, investment thesis, among all these group of PDPs? Is there a common function and role in, for example, leveraging the private sector? So with the help of uh, academics, uh, with PDBs themselves and all the other stakeholders, we will try to answer this question during the research conference uh, held just ahead of the summit on the 9th and 10th, as I said. The second question is, are we sufficiently contributing to our common agenda set in 2015? We will provide answers at our level on how to implement the 2030 agenda. And once recognizing our unique role and societal responsibility, PDBs will take measures to collectively shift uh, uh, our strategies, our governance, investment patterns, activities, and operating modalities. The third question is that in times where multilateralism is in question, could we, as a community of public development banks, join forces? And our proposition is to effectively join forces and form a new global federation of all public development banks around the world. We will build on the World Federation of DFI and its members, ADFI, ADFIAP, ADFINI, ALIDE, LT, as I mentioned, and with the support of multilateral development banks and uh, the global networks LTIC and IDFC, we will reinforce our cooperation with the view to simultaneously address the COVID-19 crisis, fight climate change, and achieve the sustainable development goals. The fourth question, the fourth objective, is um, to, to show that uh, this Finance and Common Summit is certainly not a pro-domo initiative not to talk about us it's uh, to we will invite uh, other stakeholders to join forces again to amplify the coalition movement initiated by the financing common summit so the summit is really not a one-off event we are launching an initiative a dynamic for the years to come to, to work together be beyond the above mentioned commitments uh, additional condition could be met for the PDB community to fully deploy its contribution to the Paris Agreement and the 2030 Agenda, and this is what we, we are aiming at uh, during the summit. So I can stop here with the presentation. Um, you have here on the screen the main deliverables I described, the research conference, joint declaration, individual statements from heads of state um, because what we want to do in the plenary session is to invite some heads of state and governments to talk about the role they give to their public development banks uh, to, to lead the global transformation. So this is where we are with the, with the preparation of the summit and I'm, I'm happy to answer any question you may have. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Audrey. Um, so now we will move to our um, second speaker. I just want to remind the audience that if you have any question, please put that in the uh, questions and answer tab. You can see that also on your screen, on the bottom of your screen. Um, so uh, we'll move to our next speaker, which is uh, Sonia Dunlop. Sonia will speak about the expectations uh, of MDB's announcement in their process, uh, in their progress to Paris alignment. 
Um, just um, want to introduce Sonia, is a senior policy advisor at E3G, third generation Envi environmentalism, where she leads E3G work um, and research on public banks and international financial institutions. Uh, E3G is an independent climate change think tank, think to tank, think do tank, uh, working uh, to accelerate the transition to climate safe world. Prior to, join, to joining E3G, Sonia spent five years in the solar PV industry working for the EU Solar PV Industry Associate Solar Power Europe at the European Parliament and UK's Solar Trade Association. So over to you, uh, Sonia. Thank you so much, Yossi. Thank you for the introduction and thank you everyone for joining and Audrey for giving us that overview of the Finance in Common Summit. So today, my, my name is Sonia Dunlop. I'm a senior policy advisor working for E3G, but today I'm actually going to be representing presenting a global coalition of civil society organizations that we are involved in called the Big Shift Global Coalition. Um, you'll be able to see the logo in front of you. And, um, and we are a coalition of 48 civil society organizations from all over the world, Global North and Global South, working together to shift public finance, so public development banks, multilateral development banks, from fossil fuels to renewable energy and energy energy access and towards climate related finance in general and we are led by very ably led by climate action international climate action network international as well as christian aid oil change international and many other organizations um, so today i will be speaking on behalf of the big shift global Co coalition and what i want to specifically talk about is the, the, the climate change aspect of financing of the Financing Commons Summit and specifically about how it's going to bring together all these public development banks from around the world, like as we saw on that slide, like the Hellenic Development Bank and the Banque Agricole du Burkina Faso and so on, to, to make a commitment towards um, uh, help, being part of implementing and aligning with the Paris Agreement. And that is what we hope. And that is a commitment that some of those public development banks have already made, um, for example, the International Development Finance Club, for example, the group of nine multilateral development banks and a number of others. And so what we're really interested in as the Big Shift Global Coalition is we would like to see not just that commitment, but we'd also like to see some of these banks come forward with more flesh on the bones and more detail in terms of what it means for a public development bank to align with the Paris Agreement. And particularly the nine leading multilateral development banks are working together in an official joint process to try and put more flesh on that bone and to try and really define what it means to be aligned with the Paris Agreement. And that's important because that is almost definitely going to become the go-to definition and the go-to framework and, and um, plan of action for other public development banks to, to, to follow when they make this commitment. And so our first ask as the Big Shift Global Coalition to all the multilateral development banks is please, please, if the politics permits it, come forward with your framework, publish your framework in terms of what it means to be Paris aligned, because that will allow others to them, that will allow others to copy and adapt that for themselves and to spread this best practice in the rest of the financial system. So we're saying please do come forward with this at Finance in Common, which is the right moment to do so. But then we also have very clear views um, within the coalition as to what it really means to align with the Paris Agreement. And we've, we've, we've grouped them around seven areas, as you can see on this slide, broadly following the, 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 the multilateral development bank's own uh, framework. And, and, and we have a lot of um, ideas in terms of what this really means. So number one, in terms of overall Paris alignment, we want to see every public development map that makes its commitment set a 
date by which it will be 100% Paris aligned. And that's important because it's important that this process does not drag on forever. So the EIB has said, for example, that it will be Paris aligned by the end of this year. The EBRD, we hope, will set 2022 as some kind of date. And for the rest of the multilateral development banks, we hope and urge them that 2023 should be the very latest in which they will be thinking of this. And we hope that the AIIB, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank will do this as part of their corporate strategy, that the World Bank may do this as part of their climate change action plan. Similarly, at African Development Bank, that, you know, the, a date needs to be set for 100% Paris alignment. Then we want to see public development banks in general making better contributions. We, we, are recommending a target of 50% climate finance to show that climate is really being mainstreamed with or within decisions and that should of course be a balance of mitigation and adaptation climate mitigation and adaptation and indeed on the adaptation side that the more work needs to be done to really scale up adaptation finance worldwide. And talking of adaptation, point number three on adaptation and resilience, we want every one of these public development banks to ensure that every project they finance, and indeed the, their whole portfolios as a whole, are really resilient to the physical and the financial, the transition risk aspects of climate change. And one of the things we would like to see at Finance in Common is a coalition of banks from around the world, Global North and Global South, to come together to make that commitment to really financing adaptation and resilience and closing that finance gap in that area that we desperately need to do. Area number four on mitigation, we want to see projects that are really consistent with the Paris Agreement's targets of 1.5 degrees. And we do think in the Big Shift Global Coalition that that means no financing of fossil fuels. We know that this is controversial for some, but we think it really is crystal clear. And we want to see every public development bank that makes this commitment to then follow that up with a target date for the phase out of, of support for all fossil fuels, coal, oil and gas officially in their policies, as indeed the European Investment Bank has said it will do for next year. And La my colleague Larry van der Burg from, from Oil Change International will say more about that in a minute. Number five, it is so important that these banks really provide the real policy support, engagement, technical assistance and money in order to, to really help their clients change. And in doing and, and what we're really particularly keen is we want to help, we want these public development banks to help their government shareholders, their, 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 their countries of operation to implement and to increase the ambition of the nationally determined contributions that are the core building block of the Paris Agreement. And sixth, transparency. You know, we re this is so important because in a sense, if public development banks do this behind closed doors, in back rooms, uh, it, 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 behind the scenes, the, this work will not have the impact it needs to have on the wider financial system. And that's where we really have um, a, a potential catalytic effect. And so we want to see real reporting on the levels of Paris alignment in these different banks, on the, on the portfolio level emissions, on, on how we're going to get those emissions to net zero in each one of those banks. We want to see real detail in terms of what, what these banks are doing and how they're getting there and how fast they're moving along there because we fear that this process is not happening fast enough. And finally, number seven around reporting. This is about really trying to see climate change mainstreamed and integrated in every strategy and every part of the bank, in every sector of lending, whether that be agriculture or, or, or industry or water and sanitation, every department of the bank, whether that be public sector or private sector operations, in every loan officer's own objectives that should, climate should be mainstreamed in order to make it in everyone's incentives. And of course, last but not least, most importantly, we want to see Paris alignment and climate change mainstreamed into these banks' responses to the COVID-19 uh, crisis in order to ensure that we are working towards a more resilient, more just and greener recovery. So 
those are our ideas. We encourage all public development banks to really think about this, to not dodge the difficult questions. Um, we know that the multilateral development banks have committed to presenting a framework as soon as possible and committed to presenting a whole series of different reports around this by COP26, which of course was going to happen at the same time as the Finance and Common Summit. And therefore the Finance and Common Summit is the most logical time to do this. We are very pleased to see that this area is a priority for the UK presidency and UK Italian presidency of COP26 of the UNFCCC climate change conference that's happening at the next of this year at the end of this year and on that point it is absolutely essential that we see real diplomatic engagement around finance in common we want to see the French foreign ministry and the foreign ministries of other countries around Europe and around the world really helping to support this effort to 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 bring this ecosystem of public development banks together in order to um, uh, uh, support government's efforts and the commitments that governments have made on climate change, on biodiversity, on sustainable development goals and on the COVID-19 recovery. E3G will shortly before the summit be publishing updated assessments of, um, uh, of how the Paris Agreement alignment process is going as we see it in different multilateral development banks and other bilateral development finance institutions. So please do look out for the E3G climate tracker matrix. And finally, if you want more information on these or any other topics, please do follow the Big Shift Global Coalition. We're on Twitter and Facebook at Big Shift Global. And please do join us if you're a civil society organization somewhere in the world interested in this area, but maybe not totally sure what, how, what to do or how to influence the banks in your country, your, your local area or your region. Get in touch and join us because we are working together as a community to support this process and it would be great to have you on board. Thank you very much and your see back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, Sonia for your presentation. Um, as I mentioned before if you have any questions please continue and post them on the, uh, on the questions and answer tab on the uh, bottom of your screen. Um, and now we'll move to Laurie van der Boer. Uh, and Laurie will uh, speak about the uh, uh, expectations of the High Ambition Initiative uh, to phase out finance for all fossil fuels and related infrastructure uh, and to uh, just transition. Uh, let me just introduce Laurie. Uh, Laurie is a senior campaign, uh, campaigner at uh, Oil Change International. Uh, and uh, she's, uh, she's focused on ensuring that just transition through moving government and public financial institutions away from financing and permitting the expansions of oil and gas. <clears throat> Before joining uh, OCI, uh, Lori worked at the Friends of the Earth Netherlands where she led the climate court case against Shell, filled on behalf of over 17,000 people. Prior to that, she worked with the Overseas Development Institute as a climate and energy researcher focusing on fossil fuel subsidies and energy access. Larry holds an LLM in environmental and climate change law from the University of Edinburgh and BSc in liberal arts and science from Amsterdam University College. Uh, Lori also live in Amsterdam. So uh, over to you, Lori. Um, thanks so much for that introduction, Yossi. I'm going to share my screen. So that will take me one second. We should all be able to see my slides now. Um, yeah, so first of all, um, I'd like to say uh, thank you so much to 350 for organizing this webinar. I'm very excited to uh, be on the panel today and also very excited that there is a great turnout for this webinar. I see that there are almost 80 people that have joined the webinar today. Um, so, like Josie said, my name is uh, Laudi van der Berg. I work as a senior researcher and campaigner at Oil Change International. And Oil Change International is a um, NGO um, that is uh, data-driven and people-powered, and that works to expose the true cost of fossil fuels and to facilitate a, a just transition to clean energy. 
And on the webinar today, I'm going to be talking about one very concrete uh, key deliverable of the Financing Commons Summit that a growing group of uh, NGOs is advocating for. And uh, this deliverable is uh, focused on uh, making sure that uh, the summit delivers on ending fossil fuel finance and increasing support for a just transition for workers and communities affected. And it's something that, that Sonia, of course, also already alluded to in her presentation. Um, so first, I'm going to uh, very briefly discuss the science that is behind this call for an end um, for fossil fuel, uh, an end to fossil fuel finance. And then I'm going to um, explain that currently governments and public finance institutions are heading in the wrong direction. Um, I'm also going to um, argue that oil, gas and coal are the wrong bet for a just recovery from COVID-19, not just from a climate perspective, but also from a sustainable development um, and economic sustainability perspective. And then um, I'm going to talk about how we make sure that we get public finance institutions to commit to ending fossil fuel finance at the Financing Commons Summit. Um, so first of all, I'd like to share this graph with you. This is a graph that OCI produced for the first time back in 2016. And this version uh, recently got updated by my colleague, uh, Kelly Trout, and it uses the latest data from the IPCC and the Reistat Energy Database. And this graph shows that the emissions in uh, the coal and uh, gas and oil reserves that are currently in production far exceed the carbon budgets for staying below two degrees of uh, global heating um, and also for staying below 1.5 degrees of global heating. So this tells us that if we want to stay within climate limits, there is no space for expanding fossil fuel infrastructure. And instead, we need to rapidly move away from um, fossil fuel production and use. Um, and of course, we'll need uh, public uh, uh, finance institutions to, to support that transition away from fossil fuels. Um, but if we look at what governments and public finance institutions are doing at the moment, um, uh, it's, it's, this, is, this is not yet going in the right direction. So on the left hand side, you see a graph from the UNEP a production gap report that was published in November last year, which shows that governments around the world are planning to produce 120% more oil, gas and coal than compatible with a 1.5 degree limit. On the right hand side, choose the graph that is taken from a report that OCI published in June this year that maps G20 public finance for energy and that shows that uh, the G20 public finance institutions provide three times as much public finance for fossil fuels as for clean energy and the amount of support they provide for fossil fuels which is 77 billion a year has not dropped since the Paris Agreement uh, was adopted. Um, so as OCI, we're also part of a, um, a wider coalition of think tanks and NGOs that is currently working together to track recovery money flowing uh, to energy. Um, and uh, the data that we've gathered so far also shows that there's a lot of work to be done to ensure that recovery money uh, supports the transition away from fossil fuels rather than props up fossil fuels. Um, and this is really important, making sure that this shift happens. And that's not just because of climate reasons, but also uh, because of economic sustainability and also because of energy access reasons and also uh, for stability. Um, we know that fossil fuels were already showing signs of permanent decline before COVID-19 hit. Um, we know that investments in renewable energy generate, uh, generate more jobs than investments in fossil fuels. And even if public finance institutions have long argued that uh, investments in fossil fuels are needed to deliver on development objectives, we see that the largest recipients of support for fossil fuels are not the poorest countries. And where support does flow to low income countries, it typically benefits the multinational corporations and wealthy donor countries over local populations, whilst at the same time causing human and indigenous people's rights violations and degrading health and the environment. 
What we've also seen with the impact of COVID-19 on the oil and gas sector is that reliance on such a volatile commodity uh, can be very risky, especially for low income producing countries. So whilst we've seen that the rich producing countries like uh, the United States, Canada and Norway have been bailing out the oil and gas sectors, low income oil and gas producing countries do not really have that option. And they, while at the same time facing massive budget crunches because a lot of their government revenue is dependent on oil and gas. So that clearly underlines that that a relying on or increasing a reliance on a reliance on these volatile community uh, commodities is not um, uh, uh, the right the right way to get out of the COVID nineteen crisis. So this is the moment to turn tight, especially now that governments are deploying even more public resources to get out of the COVID nineteen crisis. And um, this is also therefore the moment for public finance institutions and governments to get behind and manage decline of fossil fuels with a just transition support for workers and communities. And fortunately, we're seeing some banks that are showing leadership in this area and are taking steps in the right direction here. So in November last year, and Sanya also already mentioned this in her presentation, the European Investment Bank adopted its new energy lending policy by virtue of which it virtually excludes all oil and gas financing after 2021. And we're currently also awaiting an announcement from the UK government around ending overseas financing for fossil fuels. So that creates um, a, a really good opportunity um, to leverage that leadership and uh, to set a gold standard for Paris alignment that can inspire other public finance institutions and governments to follow suit. So as a growing coalition of NGOs, we have been advocating for this joint commitment around ending fossil fuel finance and increasing just transition support. And we believe that um, if we get uh, the diplomatic support from institutions like the EIB and AFD, but also the COP26 finance team and the UK government, if we get their diplomatic support for this initiative, this is something that is achievable for the Financing Commons Summit. We have, of course, also included this call in our letters to the president of AFD and also to President Macron. And a response we got from Rémi Rieu, the, the president of AFD, was that um, ending announcements around ending fossil fuel finance could be one of the key deliverables for financing commons. So we do see this as an achievable objective. We've also identified a number of potential candidates for this a high ambition initiative around ending fossil fuel finance, um, but are of course also still looking to expand this list of uh, potential candidates. And we're working together with a growing group of NGOs to build towards this outcome. And I've included a sign up sheet for those of you on the call that are working with NGOs and that are keen to get engaged in this work. Um, so we think that this high ambition initiative should really set a gold standard um, for Paris alignment for other banks to follow. And for this to be a gold standard, we think it needs to be ambitious. And I, we think that it rather be a small group of public finance institutions that can really lead the way. Um, uh, we think that it could better take that route than having a bigger coalition uh, that is less ambitious. And to set a gold standard, we think that this uh, joint commitment uh, should uh, include an immediate end to new fossil fuel investments and a phase out of all finance and assistance for fossil fuels, direct and indirect, by the end of 2021. We think that it should include a commitment to increase support for a just transition away from fossil fuels. And uh, we also think that uh, uh, this leading um, uh, group of public finance institutions should commit to present by COP26 uh, a detailed roadmap for full Paris alignment by 2023. So project and portfolio based. And we think that that roadmap should be built on credible and robust scenarios that take a precautionary approach to negative emission technologies. Um, I have an, a, a few other um, uh, ingredients for a gold standard or for setting a gold standard uh, listed on this slide. And we also have some more details on all of these uh, separate ingredients for a gold standard in our briefing uh, that is also linked on this slide. Um, so 
again, my final slides includes a number of links to resources that provide a bit more background on, on this initiative um, and uh, the, yeah, the key ask that we're advocating for. And I very much uh, am looking forward to the discussion uh, at the end of this uh, webinar and to continue to work with uh, those of you who have joined the webinar today and with the other panelists to uh, making sure that uh, the Financing Commons Summit is a success. So thanks so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Laurie. Let's just hope that um, what you indicated as high ambition will become the, uh, I would say, the common ambition, because that's what actually we need uh, in order really to resolve the uh, climate crisis and, and also get out from uh, the crisis of COVID-19. Um, now I'll move to, uh, to the next speaker, which is uh, Lidi, and Lidi will speak about debt, which is an important issue when we are talking about um, uh, expectations and uh, from, uh, from the summit. Um, Lidi um, is the coordinator of the Asian People Movement and Debt and Development, and she is also a board member in our organization in 350.org. Um, and so it's over to you, Lidi. Um, thank you, uh, Yossi. Um, forgive me, folks, I'm not going to turn on my video. Maybe I will for a few seconds to say hello to everybody. Uh, because, uh, hi, <laughs> because my internet is not so strong and it might compromise the audio. So um, at first, I'd just like to say that I'm, we're very supportive of all the things that Sonia and Laurie has said, because we're also very much a part, active part of the climate and energy movement. But as Yossi explained tonight, I'm going to talk about the debt, which should be one of the major issues uh, in the agenda of the Finance and Common Summit, if not the summit itself, but at least the movements engaging and challenging the summit, we should put that on top of the agenda. Next slide, please. Um, so I'd like to just uh, start with some very important um, statements about the debt problem and how we understand it. COVID-19 has really brought a sharp focus on the problem, a problem that has plagued many countries in the South for many decades. And it's very important to understand the history and roots of the debt problem in order to pursue the fair and just solutions. But we don't have much time tonight to go into that history and the roots. Uh, it's just important to emphasize tonight that it's not simply about Southern government's propensity for borrowing and accumulating debt. It is as or even more important to understand it as a problem resulting from a legacy of colonization for many countries, supply-driven lending by creditors, including public development banks or public financial institutions, unjust economic relations across countries, including financial relations and tr transactions surrounding lending and borrowing. Next slide, please. What is the most obvious and popularly understood dimension of the debt problem is that debt payments have taken a huge share of public resources and have been prioritized by governments over health, education, housing, and other services. But it's also important to point out that the impact of policy conditionalities accompanying loans and also uh, in cases in the past accompanying debt relief has been and is as harmful, uh, if not more harmful than the debt service. The tight austerity measures involving fiscal and monetary policies, privatization of essential services, trade liberalization, currency and capital accounts liberalization, to just mention a few. Next slide. Many debt movements in the South have also pointed out for many years that there is also the problem of illegitimate debt. These debts may have been contracted in our name and being paid with the use of our funds, public funds, but we refuse to acknowledge as debts of the people of the South because first there are debts we have not at all benefited from and have, not in, have in fact 
been used to finance harmful projects, and number one in our list is fossil fuel projects, debts which have violated democratic processes and laws, and we can number, we can mention a number of ways where democratic processes and our own internal laws have been violated, debts of private corporations but assumed as public liabilities, and a number of that has to do with power and energy projects, and debts which have come with highly onerous and unfair terms. Next slide. All these are part of the major reasons why debt has contributed to deepening inequality and injustice, and why we are saddled with underfinance and highly inadequate health systems and essential services, realities that have made the COVID-19 pandemic and the accompanying economic crisis and added to that the climate crisis even more devastating. Next slide. The multiple crisis we are facing today offers opportunities for us to renew our efforts in calling for solutions to the debt problem. Those which offer immediate relief and those which will have more lasting impacts and will address the roots of the problem. Uh, well, the COVID-19 has led to debt relief initiatives from lenders or creditors, but unfortunately, the current offers, very similar to the previous major debt relief initiatives of creditors in the last two decades, like HIPIC, Enhanced HIPIC, MDRI, these involve too few countries, too little amounts, very little actual relief, and an overriding concern to make sure creditors are still paid. And I'm just going to go very briefly into the two major debt relief initiatives that have been offered in the last few months. The next slide. There is the IMF, which announced its debt relief initiative in April 2020. It will provide an initial 500 million, let's remember the amounts, to be provided through its catastrophic containment and relief trust to cover the debt payments for six months in 2020 of 29 countries considered to be the poorest. So the IMF will pay the debt payments of these 29 countries. That's another way of, that's one way of ensuring that creditors will still be paid. There's the G20 announcement within the same month, the Debt Service Suspension Initiative, which involves simply a delay of debt service payments, not cancellation from May 1, 2020 to December 31, 2020. Of course, there's discussions now in the G20 whether they want to extend this time a little bit more. Countries eligible to apply are those in the list of the World Bank's IDA list and the UN's li list of least developed countries or a total of 78 countries, I mean, 76 countries and all the eligible amounts to be covered is about 11 billion. So for now, we have $11.5 billion, uh, which is the offer for debt relief that is very clear, right? But only if you apply, and several countries have not actually applied because there are consequences. Next slide. I'm just going to show in the next slide what is this $11.5 billion as compared to what is the situation? And I'm not going to go through all these amounts, but just to say this graph shows you uh, just the public debt yeah, of external debt of low and middle income countries throughout the different regions of the world, which is now called the developing world. And we're talking about more than one trillion of public debt, external debt. And we're emphasizing that because there's still the domestic debt, which is in many countries as large, if not larger than the external debt. So that's one, more than 1.1 trillion. And the offer is 11.5 billion of debt relief. And some of it is not even relief, it's just postponing the payment. 11 billion of it is just postponing the payment. The next slide will show you what it is in terms of debt, really, debt uh, servicing. Uh, we're talking about a total of 30, 371 billion of debt service. So they're, they're going to cancel 500 million. They're going to postpone 11 billion, but the total debt service that was paid in 2018 was 371 
billion dollars, almost $372 billion. So that's how small the amount that is being offered today. So just my last slide is about our demands uh, to the uh, public development banks, to the IMF, to uh, official uh, multilateral and bilateral creditors. Many of them are public financial institutions and public development banks but also our demand to the private sector who has lent to governments. So we're talking about public debt. So the first is deeper, wider public, or in other literature, they're referred to as sovereign debt cancellation for all vulnerable countries, low and middle income. Right now, they're only talking about low income and they're only talking about, they're talking about liquidity and insolvency problems. But that's not the only, it's a very narrow framework for what the problems are. So uh, cancellation by all lenders and creditors, official and private, beginning with a minimum of debt payments cancellation for at least four years without penalties. And of course, we want to ensure that our governments will spend the savings for appropriate measures to the multiple crisis, health, economic, and climate change. We are also saying no to loans as a form of COVID-19 fiscal response measures. So the little amount of debt relief is even further dwarfed by the huge amount of loans being offered as a form of uh, fiscal response measures to COVID by the World Bank, by other public development banks like the ADB, uh, by the IMF and so on. We're also asking for a UN process and mechanism for comprehensively addressing unsustainable and illegitimate debt. And debt audits by lenders and borrowers so that we can actually see what are these debts that are being collected and why we need to have them canceled for both in terms of unsustainability and the nature of these debts as Ill illegitimate debts. And then moving forward, it's not just about the outstanding debt stock that we have, it's about not accumulating further unsustainable and illegitimate debt. So we're asking for the adoption of international and national rules for fair, just, and democratic lending and borrowing processes and contracts. So I think that's in a nutshell what uh, many of the debt movements are about. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lily. The numbers are staggering, um, definitely. Um, so now we will move to uh, our next speaker, uh, which will talk about expectations from the Global South on the summit and specifically on human rights. Uh, our next speak speaker is uh, Carla Garcia Zendejas, uh, and she's the director at the Center of International and Environmental Law. She uh, leads legal strategies and accompany the communities in seeking remedies through their litigation and complaints at accountability and mechanism, mechanism and international litigation. Recently, this included advocating, advocating against development projects which threaten communities' human rights and the environment through uh, extractive industry, large-scale infrastructure, and energy projects in Latin America and Europe. Um, Carla is an environmental attorney from Mexico with more than 12 years of experience in the uh, field. So uh, uh, over to you, Carla. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yossi and, and everyone. It's, it's very good to be here uh, and to have some time to reflect. So this is, this is your last presentation you'll have to see. So I encourage everyone to take a breath. As we as we dive in, um, this is if you only take one thing from my presentation, it's this title that in 2020 we can't have a global development summit without human rights. We can't talk today about uh, everything you have heard about about the the leveraging of private finance, the interest of finding solutions. Uh, through development banks, through public development banks and governments and policies and uh, how we will be managing debt in the future without using a human rights lens and vision to figure out how we are going to do this. 
Um, I'm here, yes, uh, I, I'm part of the Center for International Environmental Law, but here today I'm speaking on behalf of the Coalition for Human Rights and Development, which is an organization that brings together 98 at the moment movements, uh, grassroots organizations, community and civil society organizations from around the world who have been working for, for several years and some for many more uh, to incorporate human rights into public development banks for many years. So there's been a lot of work done uh, for decades. This coalition is not that old, but it came to when the World Bank was reforming its safeguard policy with the spe specific goal of putting human rights into those policies and bringing that into those policies. And I want to show you why. Next slide. The coalition quickly found that uh, any community who really questions development projects uh, and does it uh, throughout the world um, has some sort of reprisal against them. Some of these reprisals may only be uh, uh, or you know public statements, but in some cases there have been uh, assassinations, massacres, and just a plethora of human rights violations, as you all know. The Uncalculated Risks Report uh, from a couple of years ago that you can access at this link, rightsanddevelopment.org slash uncalculated risks, next slide, will show you how um, we see the same things in communities throughout the world. Um, the harassment, the intimidation, the aggression against community members who voice their opinions against development projects funded by these, these public development banks that will be coming together um, next month happens too often. Uh, and too often these, these issues that we've seen and these violations basically start when people voice their opinions. Uh, next slide. Uh, the report analyzed 25 cases from around the world, and we saw very similar situations, again, in banks, European Investment Bank, European Bank Action and Development, African Development Bank, IFC, International Finance Corporation, World Bank, Inter-American Development Bank. I encourage you to go uh, to, the, to the website and look at, look at all of these very detailed analyses of 25 cases. Next slide. Um, you will recognize some of the faces that you see in these images, of course. Uh, you, will, you will have heard about them. And ultimately, what the report was meant to provide was, was um, information about how this, this, um, these reprisal issues coming out of development brand, uh, projects and proposals and policies are widespread. But what it also did was propose changes at development banks in policy and in practice. Next slide. So about the findings. Uh, unfortunately, these public development banks continue to finance projects that cause harm, uh, even though they have a duty to respect human rights. That has been recognized. We're not, I'm not, we can debate that at another session, but I'm not even going to go into that question today. Um, the links that we've seen with funding from these development banks even being used by security forces has also been documented. And it, it basically starts when someone is called, uh, for example, anti-development. Next slide. So when this lack of, of consent and consultation sometimes happens is in, in specific projects, just the lack of inclusion of communities in decision the projects that will affect their lives and livelihoods has that initial uh, reaction for communities where reprisals begin. And these, these development banks have the leverage, have the ears of the governments that they are supporting, yet in many cases they do not do uh, anything to stop or to um, indicate that these reprisals are not um, accepted. Um, there have been many years of ad advocacy, as I've said. Now banks and uh, several banks have uh, policies on zero tolerance against reprisals, but much more is needed. Next slide. 
So again, in 2020, as we all face the pandemic and the impacts, be them economic, social, uh, in our health, in our livelihoods, we cannot uh, have a type of global summit that brings to together all these public development banks and, and let it be business as usual. We cannot uh, expect that the solutions that are, are expected to uh, touch on or, or move prosperity and resiliency cannot move forward without the voices of communities that have themselves become tremendously knowledgeable, not just about their rights, but about uh, the policies that, that are meant to be uh, put in place or the projects that are meant to be implemented in their communities. So uh, next slide. What we uh, as the coalition and you, uh, you more than 200 organizations have sent a letter uh, already um, requesting that uh, human rights should be the focus of the Financing Commons Summit, that there should be a commitment to both public participation uh, and, and uh, protection of civil society space. We, you only need to, to look at a few news piece, pieces a day to see this closing of civil society space, the violence against people expecting to voice opinions and opposition against policies, against uh, uh, any, any type of decision that is being imposed by governments um, throughout the world. So communities who are, again, knowledgeable, who know what their priorities are, should be at the table, should be there contributing to agenda and discussions. Next slide. So th these are, um, again, efforts from a number of organizations throughout the world, uh, from Asia, Africa, Europe, Latin America, who have expertise and specific recommendations on what changes need to be had in mandate and governments, in policies and practices, internal culture, which is one of the most important things. Without a change in mentality, we can't expect uh, the, the evolution of thought that's necessary to come up with different solutions and different ways of coming up with these solutions. The interactions between these public development banks, governments and key actors has to change. Next slide. So in following you, specific recommendations, again, about public participation, about the inclusion of indigenous peoples and respecting their right to free prior informed consent, the closing of civil society space, the zero tolerance on reprisals, next slide, but also specifically issues of um, identifying investments as my colleagues, Lori, Sonia uh, already mentioned, the issue of the climate urgency and how what is defined as that sustainable development that we all want, but with the needs of marginalized peoples to be met when we make those decisions about what needs to happen. Also, um, the international conventions and the fact that um, all of these decisions should not contribute to violating even more human rights. Uh, next slide. So again, policies about due diligence and contextual risk uh, how private sector clients should also adopt human rights environmental standards. These are things that are already happening, but they have to be a part of the conversation for all of these policies and even deliverables that are coming out of the summit to be able to take all of these into account. Next slide. So next click. So again, all of this has to do with communities that are affected uh, in the case of Colombia that just came in, uh, CL and, uh, has been involved in supporting communities. And even just yesterday, our partners were, were labeled uh, eco-terrorists um, in, in their opposition to this dam uh, in Idrituango Dam in Colombia. And this just shows that COVID has exacerbated their vulnerability because of isolation and it has exacerbated their needs 
uh, as they try to face um, the same challenges that they have been facing for decades in opposition of very large infrastructure projects, for example, that are chopping away at their environment and, and how they can move forward will really depend on decisions that are being taken today. Next slide and last slide. So we, as, the, as part of this coalition, we truly uh, invite the leaders that are taking part in this coalition, in this summit, excuse me, to, to consider the amount of knowledge that exists on the ground, communities, organizations, grassroots, and human rights defenders that are feeling firsthand the impacts of the, co of the COVID pandemic and the economic consequences that it comes with are a reality. And if we don't include these people in the conversation, if we don't include communities in the conversation, it will be the same type of solutions for the problems that we are all facing. Without a change in mentality, without an evolution of thought, we're not going to get a different response and therefore only worse and exacerbated vulnerable communities um, will be affected by all of these decisions. It can be done in a better way. It can be done, but there needs the will to do so. Here is the information about the coalition, um, and I look forward to a conversation about um, questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Carla. I think it's, uh, it's even more important in these days that when, when we see different governments around the world are actually violating people's rights to uh, self-expression and, uh, and sort of uh, organizing people to express themselves become much, much more difficult in these times. So definitely uh, really an important issue to uh, highlight at the upcoming uh, conference. At the, um, and I would like to move to actually our last uh, speaker today in, the, in, in this panel. Um, it's uh, Nancy, uh, Nancy Sage from the uh, uh, European Investment Bank, and she will talk about the uh, uh, investment bank, about their uh, expectation from the summit. Just to say that the European Investment Bank uh, moved to exclude all, uh, all fossil fuels a few months ago, so definitely one of the most progressive in, when we are talking about um, this stuff. Um, let me just introduce Nancy. So Nancy Sage is a uh, chartered civil engineer who is specialist early, specialized early in her career in transport projects and more specifically in port and coastal work. Uh, 25 years ago, she became involved in the discussion in the maritime engineering industry on the challenges of incorporating climate change impact into the design guidance of maritime project. Uh, this was the beginning of her close interest in climate change. After 13 years working as a consulting engineer, she joined the European Investment Bank in 1998. Nancy is one of the longest standing members of the, of the bank's environmental assessment group providing banks projects team uh, with due diligence support of environmental and climate matters on a wide range of projects funded by the bank. She is also a founder member of the bank's inter directorate climate working group. Uh, Nancy has specific role at the EAB's chief climate change expert, and she is responsible for leading the work on Paris Agreement alignment with other MDBs, climate finance definition and impact reporting, including the carbon footprint of the bank's project portfolio. Most recently, since, since 2018, Nancy is a member of the EU TEG, which is the Technical Expert Group uh, of Sustainable Finance. So um, over to you, Nancy. Just to check, can you hear me well? Can yes, you hear me? I'm, okay, great. Thank you. So thank you very much for in, inviting me here. Uh, I want to just um, talk a bit first about what the previous speaker was talking about, because I think this is so important. In fact, all the previous speakers have made very important points. And you've invited me here to talk about the um, um, high level event on climate change, which is part of the FIC Summit which um, the EIB is, is happy to be coordinating and leading and where we hope indeed to have 
really big steps forward in public development banks um, ambition on Paris alignment and on action on Paris alignment, not just statements on Paris alignment. But I think it's important to touch on several of the points that have been made. Um, probably I could spend my 10 minutes just responding to them to them all, but um, I'm going to particularly just talk about the, the, the previous speaker because one of the most important things about the taxonomy actually, which makes a big difference in the world of green finance is setting this very clear standard that you cannot call anything green finance unless it's making a substantial contribution to an environmental objective, which is hardly surprising, but also not causing significant harm to any of the environmental objectives and uh, minimum social safeguards. So really highlighting that any climate or green project that is um, transgressing human rights, undermining people's land rights or their right to complain or their right to livelihoods or um, right to any other uh, you know, principle, whether it's life itself, but education, health, um, it, it takes away the right to call that a green project or to call it green finance. And this is really, really important as you know, there becomes a, um, a drive to use concessional finance for climate projects, which is very important indeed to accelerate the low carbon transition and to build resilience. There is this huge inherent risk that climate should somehow overrule human rights or overrule local um, complaints because there's a global good. Um, and indeed, sometimes there will be trade-offs locally versus a larger global benefit, but they need to be looked at uh, in, a, in a transparent way. And the local community and people affected have every right to comment on that and have every right to be um, taken account of in the decisions that are made. And the fact that it's a climate project should in no way um, overrule any of those rights or good practices that should be there in any development project. Um, so I, I think there are moves afoot. <laughs> I know it sounds a bit weird to say that the EU taxonomy might help with this, but as everybody starts to try to accelerate their green finance, I think setting this very clear marker um, that not only do you have to have solid social, social safeguards, but also not harm other aspects of the environment. It's also not okay to have a wind farm in a national park and take no account of the biodiversity impact and say that that's okay because it's a climate project. So I just wanna put that on the table. I also want to say that obviously we were in that report and we had a couple of projects in there which were EIB funded. Um, we take that report and other reports very seriously and in fact, um, our social team worked with the president's office and the president made a, a pledge last year um, of zero tolerance of um, reactions uh, and, and responses to complainants. Um, so it's, it's a step. We have other things we can do. There are always things we can do better. Um, and in fact, we have uh, next year, we will be doing a full public consultation of a revision of our environmental and social policy uh, safeguards and standards. Um, and uh, I would invite you all to contribute to that when that kicks off. So having said that, I'm going to talk a little bit more now about climate, which is really my, my area of expertise. So yes, the EIB has already last November decided and approved by its board to stop funding fossil fuel projects in terms of gas, uh, oil, infrastructure, um, etc. We had not actually done coal for, for a long time because coal was excluded in our previous energy lending policy. But the real big change that we made was that we have uh, a, a non-fuel specific um, um, standard for our eligibility for any of our funding and it's called the emissions performance standard and it was 550 grams per kilowatt hour uh, in the 2013 energy lending policy which effectively excluded coal and diesel 
But in the energy lending policy from last year, this was brought down to 250 grams. And that effectively excludes all um, plain vanilla um, greenhouse gas, um, sorry, natural gas power projects. Um, this is a really important step forward. There was a huge discussion in our board with different views, but in the end, there was an overwhelming majority. And this basically means that in fact, it's not just from, from the end of next year, Sonia, any new project coming to the bank from November onwards was already ineligible if its emissions were above 250 grams per kilowatt hour. So where does this leave us for the high level event at the FIC? Well, obviously it's not enough for EIB to just give lots of um, uh, examples about what it's doing. What we want to do is try and bring together a movement of banks that are all doing more and really looking at Paris alignment of their activities holistically. So this includes more finance of what really helps, so climate finance. It includes indeed um, making sure that all the things we finance are compatible with the Paris Agreement. It includes just transition, which somebody asked a question about, which normally really refers to creating new livelihoods, new jobs and, and, and economies fit for the future in areas which are currently uh, the jobs are all in, in uh, fossil fuel or high emitting industries which need to, to close down or, or phase out. So this is what we're hoping to do. There's a lot of discussion about what kind of examples we can give. My sort of uh, topic for the high level event, it's only one hour, is Paris alignment moving from commitments to action. Because I think it's important that we start to see, as Sonia said, some firm dates. To get a real change in an organization, you've got to put pen to paper and say, this is the date we're going to do it by. Our president made a commitment in 2018 that he was confident we could do it by the end of 2020. Last year in November, the board said we should do it. I can tell you we are working flat out and it is not easy, even in somewhere as big as the EIB to do this, but we are working to have everything Paris aligned by the end of this year. So exactly what we want to do is bring other players uh, together to, to try and really push ambition on, on this, um, on the Paris alignment agenda of, of public banks. And we're hoping to bring in some examples from commercial banks and other players who are also doing this to show it's not really just public development banks, but that if public development banks don't address this, they're in danger actually of being left behind by some of the more ambitious commercial banks. So I'll stop there. Um, but maybe I can answer questions on that part of the FIC summit. And I should say that I'm only responsible for that one hour and not the whole summit. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Nancy. Uh, we really hope that sort of our, um, you know, other banks will follow your, uh, your directions and will exclude also fossil fuels as soon as possible. Um, just for the uh, rest of the panel, we will, I mean, like we are running a bit late, um, so we will continue for another five minutes beyond the original time uh, and we'll go now to um, sort of questions and answers. So um, should I ha uh, hand it over to you, um, Clemence, in terms of presenting some of the questions? So, hello everyone. Uh, so we have questions uh, around debt for Lydie and Audrey. Um, so who is raising support for debt swaps? And also do you expect major further announcements on debt relief at the summit? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be uh, quite brief. Uh, debt swaps, of course, is part of the menu of options or instruments that can be used uh, that could provide some measure of uh, debt relief and also mobilize resources for specific things like climate or the energy transition or social services or environment. But we don't have, we don't endorse debt swaps as like a general thing because debt swaps can either be not very helpful at all or have can be helpful, very much depends on the design of the swaps and um, uh, the purpose of the swaps. So because there's also debt to equity swaps, it's just, you know, equity investments in some other projects. 
So it's there as a present as part of the menu of instruments, but not as a general call for debt swaps, something like that, because you need to be very careful about the design of the swaps. And the second question, if it, are we expecting anything from the summit? Um, well, before the summit, there's some key processes going on right now that also involves some of the development banks, the major governments that affect the voting in these banks. Uh, many multilateral banks, actually, the voting, the decisions are very much on the creditor side. So uh, we're not yet very sure if there's going to be a major announcement on the debt that will be of significant difference from the current debt offers. So there might be in terms of extending the suspension period or extending a few more months, not likely widening the circle of countries that will be uh, given, uh, declared eligible for the debt relief. They're very insistent on a very narrow measure of which countries are actually in debt distress. Thank you so much, Lily. Um, uh, Clemence, do you want to take it, uh, another question? Yes, I'm sorry because we're running over time. So there are lots of very interesting questions. I'm gonna pick two that are addressed to uh, Audrey Roshkoff as well. Um, so will the joint uh, declaration likely include commitments on reporting transparency uh, by public development banks going forward so that there will be a way to measure PFI's delivery on what they promise at the summit. And then there is a second question around biodiversity and how it will be looked at in the summit, because we heard that the, the media high level events. And so there is a question on how it is being shaped. Okay, thank you very much for, for the question. Um, uh, we are two months ahead of the summit, however, uh, the deliverables are not yet finalized. So the declaration is uh, at the stage of very first draft. It will be shared by the end of the week with uh, our uh, public development banks partners. Uh, so for now, uh, it includes what you have seen in July. I shared with you all uh, the outline of the declaration. I have received many inputs on this uh, draft uh, outline. I have included them all, but now it's in the hand of the banks. They will discuss it by next week and the week after. And I think I can come back to you since you are part of the executive committee in about, I uh, would say, one month uh, to share with you the first draft of the, the now we are with the V0 and uh, after the banks are consulted, you will have the V1 in about one month and I will be able then to share with you what it includes or, uh, or not. But at this stage, uh, I have taken into account all the inputs I have received. Uh, on the biodiversity uh, side, we have actually uh, one high-level event on biodiversity. Uh, we are still working on it. It's a lot of work. Uh, we are shaping it slowly with uh, the interested banks that take the lead on this event. Um, it's the same. Sorry about it. It's not finalized yet, and uh, I will share information as soon as I have it. Again, it, I think in about one month, we will have our next executive committee and share all the documentation. Thank you for your answer. I have a question for Carla now. Um, so a participant is asking, I am wondering if the demand goes beyond FPIC and differentiates human rights and indigenous rights to ensure that it's more comprehensive and addresses colonial inequalities that MDB's practice exacerbates. Of course, thank you. And 
I think this was Eddie. I saw the question and I think I responded in writing. So if you're running low on time, uh, definitely there is a differentiation precisely because of the reasons that you pose, Eddie, because of the, the, the much higher level of vulnerability because of colonial and historical reasons, but also because of, of just the marginalization of indigenous communities. So there is a difference uh, and, and a higher standard. So I'll, I'll cut it there, but it's, it's in writing as well. Thank you. Any more questions uh, coming from the audience? So there is really one uh, question that I don't know who will want to uh, answer, uh, but about the business model of uh, public development banks and how to move from lending to de-risking. I can, I can start if possible. Um, the issue of de-risking and the, the, the definition of de-risking is very concerning to, to us, uh, specifically at CL, but uh, many others, because de-risking in many cases is deregulation. It means changes in policy in countries to allow to create this, what they call the enabling environment for finance to come in. And this is, this is a great concern with consequences that we've seen, for example, uh, in Peru, uh, where the issue of the paquetazo, this block of uh, deregulation and reform that happened, uh, flex, creating flexible avenues and fast tracking environmental impact assessments, et cetera, or creating slower, I mean, faster processes to allow for permitting that then uh, enables uh, development projects or policies to move forward. Um, and me, in many of these cases, we've seen how the changes in policy have come from World Bank um, uh, policy um, projects or development policy loans, as they're called, uh, that change the infrastructure and change the, the policy structure of a country to allow for different types of investments. That uh, is of great concern because uh, it's seen as de-risking, but only for corporations, de-risking for investment and development, direct investment to come in, but the de-risking has nothing to do with communities themselves. And so it is a concern that we have pointed out uh, precisely because of the reasons that I expressed during the presentation. Thanks a lot. And let's go for a final one for Nancy. Um, so do you have ideas on how to address some of the finance pathways supported by MDBs that are non-transparent? For instance, non-bank financial institutions, MDB funding of government funds, issuing bonds for infrastructure, etc. So yes, I just, uh, I wrote an answer, but I, I will repeat it there. Um, the MDBs, when they published their Paris Alignment Framework at Katowice, uh, put six building blocks and the fifth one is reporting and it is about uh, measuring and reporting your climate impact um, because if you don't know what it is you can't do anything about it so this is not your buildings and your travel which is covered in putting your own house in order it is about your operations and um, the other part of it is about transparently reporting on the Paris alignment of your activities. Now, the Paris alignment framework is clearly for all types of financing and MDBs have, um, we did some uh, panels at the last COP looking at um, the methodologies we were adopting for um, projects. And we made clear also in New York that we would be working then on intermediated financing. But of course, that still doesn't cover all the types of financing. You have policy-based lending, you have guarantees, you have funds. And it is important that any organization that is setting itself to be, to align its financing must cover all the types of financing. So I would just maybe double down on my, um, my uh, suggestion that the, f the date, the date that you're going to aim for for any organization whether it's a public development bank or any other organization to be to align all your financial flows is important and then building block five on transparent reporting accountability 
on pair assignment is just as important. And that should uh, enable you or any other uh, parts of civil society or shareholders or stakeholders to insist that um, an entity, whether it's an MDB or, or another entity, explains clearly how it is going to address Paris alignment in all types of financing. So I would just come back to, you know, if there's two things to be really asking for, it's a clear date and it's transparent accountability for all types of financial flows. Including, by the way, treasury, your, the in-house treasury. May I jump in and just echo and say here, here to what Nancy just said, because the all types of financing is key. And, and just to acknowledge that the changes that, that, you, that you mentioned, um, we recognize definitely. And we've seen that some, some public development banks are, are working mindfully for the future. Some are not, and that, and that I think is the difference, uh, Nancy, that, that you pointed to, that, that uh, some, are, some of this is the concern that we have, for example, with the World Bank, because it's older, because it's stagnant, and because it's, it's traditional ways of thinking of this very monolithic bureaucracy are, are not allowing it to, to move, uh, whereas many of the European uh, banks are, are changing the ways that they perceive things and moving forward. So just, just to highlight that. Um, okay, so we're about six minutes over time. Um, and I think we will uh, close our webinar here. Uh, just before closing, I just wanted to thank you, all the panelists. I mean, like it was great to see all of you here and hear from you about sort of the various expectations and about the uh, Finance and Commons Summit itself. Um, thank you a lot for joining us, uh, for all the audience for joining us and posing questions and listening. And uh, I urge you to uh, look into, um, you know, upcoming uh, webinars. There is a, a, a webinar that will, uh, that will happen next, uh, next week. And we will share the information about the webinar next week with uh, all of you um, as well. Uh, and urge you also to participate in various events and things that will happen in the lead up to, this, uh, to the summit that will happen on November 10th. Um, so we'll close here. Thanks again for everybody and hope to see you either on the streets or um, in signatures or any other place. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.